Good evening and welcome to Feet Forward with the Illinois Podiatric Medical Association. I'm the gracious host, Chris Martin. I'm here with podiatric physician Jeff Baker from the Weill Foot and Ankle Institute. Um, uh, and you are a Lincoln Park resident? Are you, are you in Chicago? Gold Coast. Gold Coast. You're, you're a Chicago resident. Great. Um, now, we know that the marathon is about a month away, but in the service to our viewers, we're going to back up our show a month in advance to actually give you some information that you can use. Because if we had the show in October, the week before the, the marathon, we probably the advice we give wouldn't be as helpful, I think. So we decided to have the show about the marathon in September. And for those of you who are um, enroll, who have signed up to run the marathon and have been training for months, or for those of you who have a spouse or a boyfriend uh, or a girlfriend who are running the, running the show, um, pay attention. We'll take your calls. Dr. Baker will answer your questions. Um, and we'll try and give some information to help people get through um, a 26.2 mile race without too many blisters, cracked toenails, sprained ankles, and other problems, okay? Now, um, as a way of further introduction, Dr. Baker is the staff podiatrist at the podiatric tent for the marathon. Is that right? Did I get that right? One of one of several staff podiatrists okay. for the marathon. And how many podiatrists do you oversee um, as part of the operation there? Well, there's about four to five podiatrists that are uh, attending physicians that work the event. And then there's about uh, maybe 10 medical residents, podiatric medical residents, and upwards of 40 to 50 podiatric medical students that volunteer. And you're a volunteer too as well, right? Correct. All, all the, the medical staff are pretty much volunteers for this event. Correct. Right? And about how many um, of the 36,000 runners that, that enter the race, how many show up in your tent looking for help with foot related, feet related problems? About me. three to 400, three to depending 400. On, on the year, um, weather, um, other things that go along with this that we see more injuries. Mm -hmm. And of the 300, let, let me ask you about some of the more common injuries and problems that you have. If you could break them down into percentages, that'd be great too. But give us the more common uh, problems that runners who have just faced that kind of grueling test um, come in and present with. In terms of from the foot injuries, probably 70% of those are blisters mm -hmm. that we see. Uh, about 20% are toenail injuries in some way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. or nail injuries. And about 10% encompass all the other types of injuries, tendonitis, um, sprains, uh, potential fractures that we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. So for the foot uh, and ankle injuries, the, the, the large majority are blistering that we see. Okay. And a common question that a lot of podiatrists probably get, and a lot of people ask themselves when they're at home, um, if you have kids, if I get a blister, is it okay to pop it? Yes, yeah, in terms of home care for a blister, uh, a blister should be drained. The large majority of the pain that comes along with this is actually the pressure from the fluid that builds up underneath the dead skin. Mm -hmm. uh, so to relieve that pressure will relieve the pain. Um, in terms of how to treat that, it is to pop the blister, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And in terms of popping that blister, uh, you can use some um, method to clean the area, to make the area sterile. Mm -hmm. Usually that would be some sort of alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to place three to four holes within that blister itself. Mm -hmm. One is not enough because one hole may close up and the blister fills back up again. But to put three to four holes in that blister, drain out the fluid, the pain will go away, but now you have an uh, open raw area mm, right. that potentially can be infected. Mm -hmm. So the treatment after popping the blister is actually for about five to seven days, once or twice a day in those five to seven days, to soak the foot in Epsom salt and warm water, just a tablespoon of uh, of Epsom salt mm -hmm. uh, in a little tub of lukewarm water okay. and place the foot in for about five minutes, soak the area, and then afterwards put a topical antibiotic such as bacitracin or neosporin on the area uh, and a Band-Aid. Okay, great. Uh, well, we do have our first caller. Is the caller still on? Okay, go ahead. Uh, good evening. You're on Feed Forward. How can we help you? Hi, thank you. I have a problem. I have one foot that's a five and a half and one foot that's a size six. Any suggestions on what I should do for shoes or where I can go? Um, some of the specialty shoe stores, and there, there's, a, there's some in the city and the suburbs, and 
that will mix and match shoes. Um, a lot of times it ends up at those stores that they make you buy two pairs of, of shoes, unfortunately. Um, there is an online service that I don't remember the name specifically, but if you were to do a search online for this, and I think it's mixmatchshoes.com or some combination of that, that is a, a service that will sell you two pairs of uh, a pair of shoe, pair of shoes with two different sizes to it. So, um, really, in terms of going somewhere and doing it, it's more difficult. But online, there are some opportunities to be able to do that, and I, I would do a search, and you can find that. Okay, that's an interesting call. How common is that uh, for people? Um, th there are different reasons. Sometimes it can be congenital that one foot is smaller than the other. Mm -hmm. The large majority of times this is some sort of traumatic event that has happened to the foot in terms of an injury that has made one foot not uh, uh, the same size as the other. Mm -hmm. um, what we see a lot more is, is not just foot size but actually limb length discrepancies. Right that one leg is longer than the other. Someone could be born with that, or there's many different injuries that can happen that makes one leg longer than the other. And that actually is a predisposing factor to a lot of injuries, especially in runners. And in those patients, we make them an orthotic that has a heel lift to, to make up that limb length mm. difference, or you can make that up with actually making a shoe or sending it to a, a podorthist um, or someone that works on shoes to actually add that heel lift into the sole of the shoe itself. Okay. Oh, we have another caller. Go ahead. You're on feet forward. How can we help you? Hi. I was wondering if you can get either heel spurs or plantar fasciitis by doing yoga or running too much? Certainly both of those conditions can can cause plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis is by far the most common condition we see in our practice. Um, it is an injury to the long ligament that goes across the bottom of the foot. There are some predisposing factors that cause plantar fasciitis. Um, is actually is actually walking barefoot. So uh, an activity such as yoga, which is done barefoot, can bring about pain to that heel area, the back of the heel area, bottom of the heel area. Um, the other predisposing factor, however, is flexibility. So a lot of times people that do yoga actually are more flexible. It's probably more from being barefoot that you get this condition, but certainly running absolutely is something that we can get plantar fasciitis from. It's the most common chronic injury that we see in the foot, most common running injury we see, and most common injury we see in the generalized population in terms of podiatric practices. Uh, and it, there is a uh, a long list of treatment options that can be done for that but first and foremost it's really stretching as much as you can icing the area not going barefoot for a period of time and wearing good supportive shoes that have a good supportive insert within them as well but certainly both of those conditions can be predisposing factors for plantar fasciitis okay thanks for your call um, before we were, before we took our calls, we were talking about um, blisters and how uh, the the marathon will certainly create these kinds of things. But 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 in addition to that, um, when the marathon comes, a lot of people get swept up in the excitement about starting a running program. You know, they see this 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 mass of humanity running through Chicago, and it's kind of cool and powerful. So they want to start their own running program. But on September sixteenth with a month out, what do you say to your running population? You treat a lot of runners and, and athletes. Um, what are you treating these runners for now a month out? And and what are the common problems and pitfalls that you're looking to help them avoid um, so they can run the race? 